Hi there, um, Alistair McMaster. Um, I'm just wondering, from an electrochemical storage point of view, is there a limit to scaling up globally? Um, is there perhaps a limit to how much lithium there is out there that can actually be used to deploy so, um, so widely? And perhaps also one needs to look at the externalities of extracting that lithium and all the other sort of chemicals that go into it. Just, um, yeah, just a question on that. Thanks, Ben. David Lipschitz. Um, fortunately, in South Africa, we still have consumer choice, as the man from ESCOM has recognized. And uh, in 2008, when I was about to go buy my new car, we had load shedding. So instead of buying a new car, I put a solar system in my house. Today, my 200,000 rand system would cost 70,000 rand. At the moment, a battery-embedded PV system is not an aspirational item. When you go and sit in an airport lounge, you see a huge poster of a 2.5 million rand Mercedes. You don't see a huge poster of energy production, storage, etc. And, you know, I would have paid the car for over five years. I paid my PV system for over five years. So I've saved 28,500 rand of electricity in the last 18 months. And therefore, I can now buy my new car. Um, as far as embedded storage goes, I think we should have embedded storage because it makes a lot of sense to have the production and the consumption from the prosumer point of view at the point where it's used. From a European point of view, your morning and evening peak is dealt with with gas. We don't have an established gas infrastructure in South Africa. So we need to find a way of dealing with that storage requirement with time of use tariffs, demand response, et cetera, from a homeowner point of view. And if we're paying IPPs 394 to supply electricity at peak time, I'm prepared to supply electricity at peak time at 394 as well. The thing that really scares me the most, as you've said as well, is that people will leave the grid. I can put eight kilowatts on my roof, okay? I only need five. That three kilowatts is lost to the system if I just go off grid. We don't need EIAs, we don't need grid strengthening, we don't need NSF, we just need to use existing grid infrastructure and get all that embedded energy and embedded storage into our system as soon as we can. Hi, it's Clyde Mallinson from Virtual Energy and Power. Um, I'm pleased to say that our biggest problem at the moment as developers of wind and solar um, facilities with storage is do we do it immediately because the business case works already or do we wait for a while because the batteries are getting cheaper? So we can do it today. We can sell at less than ESCOM wholesale prices with storage and our only decision we have to make is should we wait a while where we, where we will be able to sell at less than less than ESCOM prices with storage. So it's not a future thing. It's currently economically viable to deliver wind at this stage with storage and in a short while solar with storage because wind happens still to be cheaper than solar on a large scale. So I just want a, 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 a comment on the fact that it's not a future thing, it's current, and it's only going to get more beneficial in the future. Thank you for the excellent presentations uh, on storage. I'm also from Canadian Solar, but more on the development, project development side and looking in particular at Africa. Um, and I think this discussion today has been, I mean, today has been quite Eurocentric, quite South African-centric, and I'm, I'm more interested and challenging the, the panel to think about if you are an African government or an African market that wants to plan you know, to, how to strengthen the grid, whether it's in Nigeria or Ghana or wherever, or, or Zambia or Namibia, you want to strengthen the grid and you want to meet the demand that's there for electricity, how would you think about optimizing storage in part of the mix with renewables and, and with fossil fuels, obviously? Thank you. So I'm interested in your economic views of, of the challenge of storage. And if you had all of the, you know, I recognize there's a universe of options available to you, but from an optimization of the economy point of view, how would you invest? That's the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to pick on that last one because um, I think about three years ago I did a presentation and it talks about Africa will jump the grid. And what I mean with that is Africa did the following on the communications industry. They went from nothing to mobile. They didn't put landlines in. And I think if you look at Africa with its 1.2 billion people and only 30% have access to electricity, there's a huge opportunity for Africa to jump the grid. And how will they do it? 
Well, the storage plays the big role. It will be mini grids, micro grids, off grid solutions with storage. And the storage solution will be some um, solutions. I think to build a grid for big countries that have got very distributed population is going to be just not affordable in Africa. And therefore, I think solar, with its distributed generation method, that's exactly what you can do with it. You can basically make power there where it is needed, and you don't need to build that kind of grid. Yes, we will have to have inter-country links and stuff like that. We will have hydro resources in Central Africa. Um, yeah, maybe we also have, I, th I think, whoever has been to Lagos, um, we've got so much diesel and petrol generation in, in the city of Lagos. I think that can power half of Africa anyway. But I, I think, you know, there is an, a need for a certain grid, but I, I don't see it all over Africa. And I will see Africa with a storage solution to jump the grid area. Thanks. I, I'd, I'd also like to just start with that one. I think what Africa, I agree with you, I think what Africa's got to its advantage is it doesn't have as as in some countries in Africa, I don't want to generalize, doesn't have 90 years of history like Eskom's got. Eskom's built power stations based on coal for 90 years, 90 plus years now. Now what we've got is this asset that's coal based and I'm very delighted at the discussion in the room because what I'm hearing is that we are now, Clyde, we have solutions which are non-coal based. The externalities of coal, not only the coal price and the carbon problem, but also water use and water issues in the country. So coal is a, is a troubled um, commodity at the moment, not just because of the labor issues, but just in terms of use. But Eskom's got this 90-year history based on this stuff, and now we're also wanting to transform, believe it or not, to the future. It comes back to the legislation and the policy issues about who's allowed to do what in the country. But I can, I can assure you that inside the country, we want to transform as much as the next guy. But you've got all this asset sort of on your back, and you, you can't just sort of get rid of it overnight. So I think where Africa's got an advantage in some countries is that you start with these solutions like, I would say, rooftop PV on every house, depending on the solar radiation, depending where it is. I would say we mentioned solar water heating earlier. It's, it's a no-brainer. You should heat water with the sun, not with electricity. I would say you, you, you ban incandescence and all these high-energy consumption devices, LEDs for all. You put in intelligent metering devices which allow you to switch loads on and off on demand. And only once you've done all of that, then you decide how much so-called base load do we need and is that base load going to be coal, nuclear, gas, or what is it? But you start with the, the other end of the equation. In South Africa, we kind of started with the supply of energy. We, we're kind of trying to figure it out. In some countries in Africa, you can start with the demand and work backwards. Mr. Lipschitz, you'd be surprised to know that I agree with most of what you've said. You know, Elon Musk, they say, is the world's greatest uh, marketer. His battery that he puts on the wall um, because it's an Elon Musk battery, is he in the room? I hope he is. Um, is, is taken as a sort of a, a godsend. But many people who know say that battery has been around for a long time. But because it's now an Elon Musk battery, it's like a wonderful thing. But why I say he's a great marketer, because in California he's saying exactly what you're saying. He's saying, people, you have a choice. Put in a swimming pool in your house or put a battery in your garage because it's about the same price in California, apparently. Now, Californians are switching to batteries fast because there's also a drought in California. No one wants a swimming pool anymore. But it's a lifestyle choice. It's a choice about, do I want this thing in my life? Same as buying a car. You know, people say we can't afford rooftop PV with storage, but we buy new cars all the time. I think South Africans particularly are very bad at buying cars on credit, and we have no problem with buying a 250,000 Rand asset and spending 400,000 Rand on it over five years. So, Dave, that comes back to the LCOE. What's the LCOE of a car? I mean, it's bizarre. But we won't spend the same amount of money on a, a, an energy solution. So this issue of, and I like the comment, I'm going to take it back into my organization. The customer's not leaving the, 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 the power company. The power company is leaving the customer. It's a, it's a worry for us, to be totally honest with you. I mean, we do also have these discussions about what if everyone, because let's, the question was asked, is the future... PV and storage, maybe it is to some extent, but if that happened tomorrow, if we had a black swan event and storage suddenly dropped 90% in price, PV dropped 50% in price, and everyone in this room, including the convention center, just decided, well, that's it, we're off the grid. Hey, man, it's the, it's, uh, don't applaud now and don't cheer, please. It would be the end of the power company, as you know. Um, 
But that also has externalities because you have all these assets, you have all these coal mines, you have all these people, you have all these power lines. I've even got a presentation, you mentioned one of yours, I've got one somewhere on my hard drive called the end of transmission. Because the days of having to move bulk power around the country could be very close to being yesterday's news. Um, so it's not, we're not totally opposed in our thinking. The question more for Eskom than for yourselves is how does Eskom morph? How does Eskom change? We're a massive utility, 90 years of history, coal-based, 44,000 people. Some people would say, well, you're not going to morph, you're just going to die. Others would say, get on the bus, and we would say, we want to get on the bus. Help us get on the bus. So we're not opposed. I, I think solar water heating systems, rooftop PV systems, storage systems, all part of the future. I would like to, because I've been with the organization a long time and I'm very loyal to it, take my organization into that future. So putting a rooftop PV system up that we... You don't have to buy your car, you lease your car. So we bring you the system, we put it on your house, and we lease it to you over the next 10 years or so. And then it's yours, lease to, lease to buy. Um, the, the country, and then I'll keep quiet, Ben, the country's got a great example of this in, in electrification. We did 4 million homes in 10 years. It was a subsidized program. It was state-driven. It created huge market potential for, for private industry. And by all accounts, it's a massive success. Initially, it didn't make financial sense, right? Going into a very poor area of the country and giving someone an asset that they can't afford didn't make a lot of sense. But we know in our gut that it's a good thing to do. And I think sometimes that's the definition of leadership. You do something because it makes sense, not because your LCOE spreadsheet says it's a good thing to do. We know rooftop PV makes sense. We know solar water heating makes sense. We know smart metering makes sense. So I think we should just do it. It's not as simple as that when you work in a multinational, a multi sort of huge, monolithic, <laughs> slow organization. But, but we, are thinking, we are thinking along those lines and we will change. Yeah, I think there was one question in terms of the resources on, on lithium. I think that is, wow. is an absolute yes, there is enough uh, resources for that. That's what I've read. I think the, the lithium question is also a question of cost. If you want cheap lithium, maybe they're, mo they're maybe not directly immediately available, but if you can take lithium out of seawater, then obviously there will be enough uh, lithium. And, and I don't think we did justice to Clyde's question. He's probably feeling a bit left out there. Um, Clyde, it's a bit like a stock market analyst. You know, Do you buy the share today or do you buy the share tomorrow? Um, if it makes sense today, I would I would buy it. But I think what you're struggling with is that the, sh the stock market is not a market yet. It's a designed rollout of, of, of a program which is very, very successful. But in a free market, totally free market, your products and your projects that you've got in, in, in the pipeline, you should put them on the ground today because they make sense today. But the market at the moment is not totally free. Um, now in South Africa, we have an interconnected power system already. Um, and even if you don't have an interconnected power system, to build a grid, it's incredibly difficult from a from an, um, uh, regulatory perspective, from the perspective of getting the servitudes in place, and that's, th that's the case for almost every country, but it's also on an LCOE basis incredibly cheap. So we have to keep in mind, at the end of the day, we are building a power system, and I, sorry, I tend to disagree. There. I think to build a power system is not a lifestyle decision. It's a decision that has to be made on the least cost basis. And we can build a least cost power system today in South Africa based on a large amount of renewables. If we introduce large amounts of battery storage into that system, even if it makes sense for an individual market player, it is at least today not the least cost solution for the system. And we will artificially increase the cost of introducing renewables into the system. And we will defeat the purpose, which is we want to bring more renewables into the system. To give you a very simple example, think of two houses right next to each other. Each of these houses now builds its own system based on PV and battery and goes completely off the grid. Now what you have to do, you have to massively oversize your PV system. You have to build more PV than what you actually consume for two reasons. The one reason is your batteries are associated with efficiency losses. They are small, but they are there. Secondly, you have to size your PV system for those days where are little, uh, which are little, especially in the Northern Cape, but there are these days where you have a cloudy day. Um, you have to size your PV system such that even on a cloudy day, you have enough energy produced to supply your battery, which subsequently will supply yourself. So you, you will oversize both the battery and the PV system. Now your neighbor does exactly the same. 
in total, you spend a hell of a lot of money on both PV and battery. If you create a link between these two houses, even if they are right next to each other, to create the link in form of a grid is super cheap. And suddenly, you will have to invest much less, both on the PV side and on the battery side, because you start balancing each other. And that's only due to the effect that you have different load profiles. Now, if you take that example, you take the one customer sitting in Cape Town, the other one sitting in Durban, you not only balance each other because you have different load profiles, you balance each other because you have different solar resource. And the reality is, I mean, we have to go back to, 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 uh, to, to physics, that the, the, the energy in an interconnected electricity system travels with the speed of light. So a PV system here in Cape Town effectively supplies a customer in Durban, whether we like it or not, but that's a reality. Once the electrons are in the system, it's a big power pool. You, you can't, it's like, like a pool of water that you supply with water from different sources. Once it's in the pool, you can't really differentiate where the water is coming from. And that, uh, um, and that in, 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 in many African countries, there it's, an, it's a different starting position because the interconnected grid is not there yet. But in South Africa specifically, this interconnected grid that we have is a huge asset. It helps us tremendously to introduce large amounts of renewables into the system. You can argue that a PV system in Cape Town can to some extent cover the evening peak in Durban. You don't have that if you cut the grid. If you think it in the extreme, now that's of course an ex extreme thing, but just to make the case, if we had, an, and, and by the way, the, 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 the lateral distribution of the power system is an additional advantage. South Africa spanning 2,000 kilometers from east to west, especially when it comes to the sun, that's perfect because the sun rises one, one and a half hours earlier in Durban than in, than in Cape Town. That's a huge benefit. Countries like Chile are in a different position. Uh, <laughs> but um, but if, you, if you just make a thought experience, if we had an interconnected grid spanning the entire globe, you would have sun power all the time, 24-7, everywhere, right? So, and that's, of course, unrealistic, but it's just to, to, to give you that thought experiment that we, we must not forget that to be interconnected has huge value. And I understand that, especially in South Africa, because of um, developments in the last year, we somehow don't like that notion of being interconnected because it relates to the utility, but it is a very good thing, and it will help us all together to arrive at a least cost renewable space power system. Yeah, I think we should declare our interest here. Tobias and I are actually good mates, and... Uh, <laughs> And no, just seriously though, the CSIR and ESCOM are working very closely on this. We have a, we have a contract between us, the Energy Research Center and our own. There's also a energy storage group uh, uh, set up. Uh, we're in our early stages. The IDC is involved. Uh, Sanedi is chairing the group. Uh, we've got SAPVIA we want to invite. So we are, is there, et cetera. So there is an energy storage community forming. So we have these debates not just in front of you but also behind closed doors. I just wanted to say I agree with Tobias, but it's also part of the problem. Designing the future, we ask the question, what will the future look like, is a very different question to a system, uh, like a, a, a power system designer, like an Eskom power system planner who's looking at a grid system versus an individual homeowner who's looking to put something on their roof. Um, we talked about the mini Eskoms earlier, and, 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 and um, each one of you has the potential to be a mini Eskom, but you will design your mini Eskom different to maybe Eskom would have designed it if we had worked with you to design the future. And that's the challenge is can we design a future for South Africa as a, as a community that's not an us and them that says this is the most, I won't say the most least cost, I will say the most cost effective way of doing it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's the same. It's the most value added way of doing it. Um, and we do that in conjunction with the regulator and with the Department of Energy and believe it or not with Eskom and with the CSIR and with you guys, is to design the future that makes sense, um, rather than just sort of let it happen. Because if we let it happen, it might not pan out the way it adds the most value. 